So we're doing the book of Colossians. And in case you didn't know, you, you, if you have the opportunity to sign up for a life group, a, this is a chance for you to study it in more detail, because that's what we're going to do in our, in our life groups. We're going to actually be going through the book of Colossians. We're going through it, and questions will be provided. It'll be a great time of discussion, time of prayer, and relationship building. Okay, so here's a quiz for you. All right, obviously, these are easy answers. Who wrote the book of Colossians? Paul. Where was he when he wrote it? He was in prison. Where? In Rome. Who went to see him to ask for help? You don't have to be able to pronounce the guy's name. Yes, Epaphras. Okay, that's a good one. Or Epaphras. No, Epaphras. I prefer that. But why did he go there? Because they were having problems in their church. He started the church. He was pastoring the church. And then who came in, generally speaking? Who came in? What kind of teachers came in? False teachers. And were giving them ideas and thoughts that were contrary to who Jesus really was and is. And so we're looking at this series called Greater Than. Jesus is greater than all things. And we, we don't want this just to be like a theology class where you learn all this great information. We want to be able to take it and apply it to our lives and be able to go, okay, this is how I want to embrace the supremacy of Christ. I want to be able to yield to him. Okay, I want you to listen to this little sound clip, I guess you'd call it. And see if you've heard this before somewhere. If we can play that. Gentlemen, start your engines. Okay, that's an easy one. Okay. Where do you hear that? NASCAR, right? NASCAR. And Canapolis is famous for who? This is easy. Come on. Dale Earnhardt. Now you go, oh, that's easy. When we moved here, one, I had never heard of Canapolis. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. I had heard of Dale Earnhardt, but I didn't know he was from your town. Now when you think about race car drivers, they don't want to do what would take place in Fast and Furious when they go around a corner, when they go around a curve. They don't want to drift because if they drift, what are they going to end up doing? Hitting the wall, crashing into each other, ruining their tires, losing time. Today's message title is called, Don't Drift. Don't Drift. We need to stay true to our beliefs. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, the writer of the book of Hebrews was challenging those who were in Rome. They were actually Jewish believers. That's why the book is called Hebrews. And they were drifting from their faith, from what God had taught them through whoever reached them with the gospel. He says this, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. The church at Colossus was facing false teachers who were challenging them in their beliefs about Jesus, and they were tempted to do this. In chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Continue to believe the truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away. There are times we drift. We drift about who Jesus is. We drift about our ideas of what the Scripture says. We drift in our relationship with Christ. So how can we stay true to our beliefs? And you go, well, you know, Christians don't drift. Barna Research, in 2020, and they continue to do research on not only the, uh, what people believe, but also what Christians believe. And in 2020, Barna found, this is a quote, that there are numerous outlooks among self-identified born-again Christians that conflict with biblical teaching. These include the idea that there are no moral absolutes, that certain things are not right and wrong, as the Bible tells us, that all faiths 
all faiths are equal, and if people are good enough, they can earn their way to heaven. Professing, professing Christians are developing more and more decidedly unchristian beliefs. And you go, oh, they, they probably weren't saved. Just think about it. The church at Colossus was struggling with this. They were believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is challenging those in Corinth because they were very influenced by their culture, thinking that there's no such thing as resurrected body. And Paul's like, well, if there's no resurrection of the body, and that's what resurrection is about, then your faith is vain. You see, when you drift in your beliefs, it affects your life and your actions. So how do we stay true? How do we stay true to our beliefs? What do we have to do? Here's the first thing. And these seem very simple to understand, but sometimes very difficult to do. Recognize Jesus as Lord. And Jesus is God. See, as believers, as people who know the scriptures, you go, oh, this is, this is baby stuff. But think about it for a minute. Jesus is God. And in Colossians 1.15, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. I was a new believer when I went off to Bible college. I got saved in high school, went right off to Bible college. And I would go into parks, me and some friends, some guys from school would go into parks and we would share our faith. And in Philadelphia, there were all sorts of interesting people that you would run into with all sorts of different ideas. I left my safe environment of Bible college, and I went into the lion's den, so to speak. And people would say all sorts of weird stuff. I ran into this one cult that was called the Children of God. I'm like, oh, their name is the Children of God. Oh, okay. And they showed me verse after verse where they did not believe Jesus was God. And as a new believer, I'm going, oh, my goodness. What is going on here? And I began to drift in my faith until I went to some other mature believers, and they go, no, no, no. They're taking it out of context. They're not applying the whole scriptures. And they showed verses to me like this, or in Hebrews, that it makes it very clear that Jesus is God. See, all cults and major world religions don't believe Jesus is God. Why? Because, well, one, it's man-centered religion, so they're like, we don't need Jesus to be God. He's just a man, and therefore we're going to work our way. But what's your view of Jesus? Do you believe he's God? Then what's the evidence that you're submitting to Jesus as Lord? I have to ask myself that every day. Well, well, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. He's not only Lord, but he's also the creator. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, it says this. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Remember, he created the angels, and then what happened? <laughs> One-third fell, one-third followed Satan, which his name at the time was Lucifer, which meant light. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Jesus is the creator. Now I want you to think about this. I want to make it a little bit personal here. Do you know that he made you? He formed you in your mother's womb. He, he created the day of your conception and development, and he made you just the way you are. Do you complain about what you look like? You want to be taller or prettier or smarter. Don't blame that on God. Okay. You can work on the smarter part. He wove you in, his, in your mother's womb. He wove you. He put you together, as Psalms tells us. Since he created you, why 
not give thanks? He's not only the creator, he's also Lord of all. Even the church, you're going, oh, you're stepping on toes now. The theme verse, really, for this book in chapter 1, verse 18, says this. He, referring to Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. I find it interesting that some churches treat Jesus as if they are Lord of the church (laughs) and Jesus is their humble servant. You go, what? Oh, yeah, think about it. Jesus, come and bless what we want. Jesus, we want this. We follow our bylaws, and, well, the Bible, we'll just set it aside. In Revelations 2 and 3, Jesus leaves a church. He doesn't leave the individual. You are secure forever. He's always going to be in your heart. But a group of people who call themselves the church and are no longer calling Jesus Lord or submitting to his lordship, he says, I'm out. I'm out. Read it. Revelations 2 and 3. He says, I'm going to remove the lampstand. But they continue to meet as if nothing happened. Henry Blackaby, in his book, Flickering Lamps, says this. The key, and he's talking to churches. The key is, this is for us too. The key is to cry out to God and beseech him to reveal his plan to you. As a church, you have the Holy Spirit present within you who knows God's mind. His role is to guide you into the will of the Father. I have also learned that if you pray for God to guide you, you had better keep your spiritual eyes open So you can recognize where God is already at work. It didn't take long for God to begin revealing his plan for our church. And that's true of our lives, too. Lord, I want your will. I want to surrender to what you want. And then be open to it. Be open to it. So that's the first part. Recognize Jesus as Lord. The second one is embrace Jesus as Savior. You know, yeah, I've already done that. I know. I know Christ. He's in my life. I'm saved. But here's what I want you to be thinking about. If you know Christ, realize and grasp what he has done for you. The work of salvation. And I'm not saying this to promote myself or anything, but I, God led me to write a second book. I'm working on a book called Stories of Redemption. And I'm going back to how I came to Christ. I didn't grow up in a Christian home and how God led me to himself. And and then some of my family members came to Christ. And and it's a really, it just made me realize, wow, I do not deserve salvation. Jesus did the work. And I put my faith and trust in what he did. So here's the first First idea, embrace Jesus as Savior, the incarnation. You're going, what does that mean? It simply means that God became flesh. That's what it means, incarnate. Chapter 1, verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. All his fullness, not part God, part man. Fully God, fully man. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh, that's referring to Jesus, and made his dwelling among us. That word dwelling among us is actually the word for tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, this is the one person, the Son of God, came to earth, took on human flesh. One person, two natures. Do you understand it? No, neither do I. How does that work? I don't know. That's what the scriptures tell me. In Bruce Shelley's book, Christian Theology in Plain Language, by the way, if you're looking for something to really help you understand, that's a great book. You're not going to find it in print. You'll have to search it through Amazon used books, but it's an excellent book on Christian theology in plain language. He addresses this issue. Now think about this for a minute. He says, 
if Jesus only appeared to be human and never really lived among men, if he was a ghost, then the gospel is a myth. This was what the problem that the Colossians were having because some people were saying, well, he couldn't have become a man because flesh is evil. Now, Jesus didn't have an old nature like we have. He was born of a virgin. He had no sin. He never sinned, and he didn't have a sin nature. He did not have a sin nature. He goes on. Some early Christians insisted that Jesus was really and fully just a man, that God simply empowered him by a special gift of the Spirit. That's what some Christians believe today. That's crazy. That's what some cults believe. Well, he was just a man, but God gave him special power and ability to do things. That's not true. Listen to this. Since Jesus was a normal human being, born of, bo of our bone and flesh of our flesh, he could fulfill every demand of God's moral law. He could suffer and die a real death. Since he was and is truly God, his death was able to satisfy divine justice. God himself had provided the sacrifice. He was perfect man and perfect God. <laughs> And in his life, he faced those temptations in the power of the Spirit. That's why <laughs> there are times when Jesus is surprised when things happen. You go, well, how is that possible? He, he knows everything. But the, it, Philippians tells us he emptied himself. He didn't stop being God. He stopped acting like God. He stopped relying <clears throat> on his God power, and he relied on the Holy Spirit to show him and lead him and empower him. C.S. Lewis says this in Mirror Christianity, another awesome book. If you're looking for answers, which we all need to be able to find the right answers for certain times, he says, I have heard some people complain that if Jesus was God as well as man, then his suffering and death lose all value in their eyes because it was easy for him. Then he gives this illustration. If I'm drowning in a rapid river, a man who still has one foot on the bank may give me a hand, which saves my life. Ought I to shout back? No, it's not fair. You're keeping one foot on the bank. That advantage, call it unfair if you like, is the only reason why he can be the one the, any of use to me. To what will you look for help if you will not look to the one which is stronger than yourself? Jesus is perfect God, perfect man. Are you drowning in sin? He can rescue you. He can rescue you. See, embrace Jesus as Savior. Not only did he come to earth, take on human flesh, live the perfect life, but he also went to the cross. And the cross brought peace. Colossians 1.20, listen to what it says. And through him, through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. When Adam and Eve sinned, God said, the day that you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what's going to happen? You're going to die. The crazy part is they didn't drop over dead right there, did they? They kept walking around and hiding from God and, he was talking about spiritual death. They eventually died physically, but they died spiritually. That's why they hid from God. That's why they were ashamed. That's why they didn't. They started blaming each other. You know how married couples sometimes do that? You gave me the wrong directions. What? It's the GPS. But not only did Adam and Eve die when they sinned, died spiritually and eventually physically, but the whole of creation was affected. The whole of creation. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. And he's referring to God cursing creation because of man's sin, man and woman's sin, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay 
and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. How is that going to happen? Because Jesus died and brought peace. Brought peace. Someday Jesus is going to restore his creation. It's called the millennial kingdom. <laughs> He's going to lift the curse. And then someday after that, a thousand years after that, the new heaven and new earth. But he wants to bring peace to your heart. What is it that you're wrestling with? What is it that you're going, man, I just don't have peace. He wants to give it to you. Are you at war with God? Are you wrestling with something? You go, man, I just can't find peace. Surrender it to me. The cross also brought reconciliation. Chapter 1, verse 21 of Colossians. This includes you. Not only did God work on creation, Jesus worked on creation, but he's working on people. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. And the word reconciliation means to change a relationship that was once hostile, bring people together. A change in a relationship from hostility to harmony. I want you to think about a relationship. I doubt that there's anybody here that said, I have never had a problem with anybody and always got along with everybody. And I'm always peachy keen with what's going on. I never had somebody who maybe was a good friend of yours and they turned their back on you like Judas did to Jesus. And there's hostility when there once was harmony. And you're like, you know, I had to work that out. I had to go talk to them. We had to work it out. It was difficult. And parents, if you have teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? We have four children. It includes you when you come to faith in Christ. I remember the day that I came to Christ, there was this huge weight of guilt and shame that I was carrying. And the day I came to Christ, there was peace. I felt this weight lifted off of me because I was running from God. And I surrendered. <clears throat> Romans 5.10 says this. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through him? See, God isn't the one that moved. When people, Adam and Eve and anyone else, when they're born, they're born in that sin, the sin of rebellion, and they need to do this. Pretend like, you know, here's God. You're, you're like that. And it, we just basically turn our back on God. And when we come to faith in Christ, this is what we do. Because God didn't move. Jesus didn't move. He came toward us, and we kept running. We kept running. The cross brought reconciliation. The cross brings forgiveness. Verse 22, but now, he has rec but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now, the Colossians were struggling with the idea of the, Jesus being a physical man. And so Paul just throws it right at him. By Christ's physical body, it was a real body. He really died on that cross. says present you through death to present you in his sight that's a, that's a term that's used it's a term that's used of being presented in court now you probably wondered why I brought this giant bible up here and it's, a, it's really a cherished gift. My mom gave this to me in 2014. She passed away a couple years later. <clears throat> but <laughs> she noticed I was having trouble reading, not reading, but she, seeing words. I was having trouble seeing words because my eyes were getting worse. And so she got me a giant print NIV study Bible. <clears throat> Now, she never used Amazon, but she got my brother to help her order it and have it delivered. I was shocked. 
And I said, oh, Mom, thank you. And I still use it today. But I want the Bible to represent Jesus. I want this to represent him. And I want this book to represent you, you or me. There was a day of your birth. That's the first page. There's going to be a day of your, your death, your departure. If you know Christ, you're going to go to be with him. He's already got that marked out. <clears throat> but all these pages, let's just say it re is a record, <laughs> a record of your life. Let's say each page is a day. And maybe there's, <laughs> there's a record of sins, of the sins that you commit, if I com that I have committed. And you look and you go, oh, I don't want anybody to know about that. Or I am so embarrassed that I did that. <laughs> it's there. It's in God's mind. Every day, every moment. And you go, yeah, but what does he do about it? Remember, when you came to faith in Christ, he took you and your sin, he placed you in Christ, and now what does he see? He sees Jesus. He doesn't see you. He doesn't see your sin because he has forgiven it. He has forgiven it. He's taken it out of the way. How did he do this? Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 says, You were dead because of your sins. That's that spiritual death. You were cut off from God. Because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ. The moment you came to faith in Christ, he placed you into Jesus, and now he looks and he sees Jesus. For he forgave us how many sins? All. Oh, that's our position in Christ. He has forgiven all our sins. There is no way that any of us would get to heaven if he only forgave 99.999%, but that one. Oh, no, he can't forgive that. It says here, all is all. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. You're in Christ when you trust in him alone. You go, yeah, but you don't know my life. Well, you don't know mine either. <laughs> and the struggles that we have with daily sin, that's a whole different story. That's called staying in fellowship with Christ. We prayed, and as we sang that, Lord, the Holy Spirit, fill us. Because there are times we're not filled with the Spirit. <laughs> and 1 John tells us, when the Holy Spirit reveals sin to you, what do you do with it? Confess it. Turn away. Let him reveal it. Let him show you. Because if you're poking around, try to find it, you're always going to find something. Let him show you. And then when he, you confess it, guess what he says you should do? He says, well, forgive us our sins. This is for fellowship. And purify us from all the other things, all unrighteousness that you don't even know about. So you can walk in fellowship with him. Draw on God's bank account. He has forgiven all your sins. It should not make you go, well, I can live any way I please. Well, then you ought to really look at yourself. You ought to be concerned. <laughs> Read Hebrews 12, because if you're not being disciplined, if you're not conscious of sin and things that you do that are wrong, then maybe you don't belong to him. See, Jesus said that we would be forgiven, but also without blemish. This is a word that was used in the Old Testament sacrifices. How could you and I ever be perfect in God's eyes in our own flesh? There's no way. It's impossible. That's why man-made religion does not work. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him, Christ that is, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On that cross, Jesus took all the sins of the whole world that ever existed from the time of Adam and Eve all the way to the very last one. You go, well, why isn't everybody saved then? Because God says they have to believe. The medicine has been provided, now they have to take the medicine. If they don't, it's not going to help them. 
If you haven't, it won't help you. You see, Jesus is the eternal God. His death provided eternal satisfaction for all the sins. You know, when he was on the cross, Jesus said, not only did he say, it is finished, but remember what happened to the sky, the light? It went to what? Darkness. Because at that moment, he was bearing all the sins of all time and all, that, all the sins that ever will be, and the Father looked away. When Jesus was on the cross and he took all the sins, he was suffering as an eternal person. He was suffering eternal punishment on that cross for you and I. Now, you go, well, why in the garden was Jesus wrestling with the Father? Can't you just take it away? I don't think it was totally the physical pain that he knew he was going to have to face. I think it was the broken relationship that had never happened between him and the Father because he was bearing our sin. That's what he did for us. This forgiveness also means that when you come to faith in Christ, there is no accusations. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Not one thing. He remembers your sins no more. And this is our response. This is what we should do. This is how we should respond to such amazing scriptures that tell us who Jesus is. Believe the truth. You know, it's easy to know something in your head and not totally believe it. It's kind of like I, I hear people say this. I've used this before. It's like, yeah, I believe airplanes can fly. I'm just not getting on one. And it's okay. If you're afraid of flying, that's fine. Take the bus. Drive the car a lot longer. But you realize that Jesus, Jesus wants you to go beyond just knowing something is true to really believing it. Trusting. The church at Colossus was in danger of drifting from right doctrine about Jesus. Listen to chapter 1, verse 23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. How do you do that? 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Pay attention to what's going on in your life and go, wait a minute. This is not the right way to go. Be established. He goes on in, in verse 23, Stand firmly in it. That word, be established, means to have a good foundation. Way back in Syracuse, we had neighbors that were right next door to us, and the area was called Cicero, and we had a major, this sounds really weird, but it was a nice area. It was Cicero Swamp. That meant that the water table was really high in that area, and they put basements in. I don't understand it. And we weren't far from Chittenango Creek, on the edge of a flood zone. They put a basement in. Not in our house, we had a crawl space, thankfully. But the next door neighbor had a basement, and you know what happened to the foundation walls? They deteriorated. She had to have a crew come in and dig up that whole backside of her house and put in new foundation blocks. You see, God wants us to stand firm. Establish yourself. In the word of God, be established, have the good foundation. Jesus is the foundation. 
Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've never really learned that. I've never really built, I'm a believer, but I don't have a good foundation. I need to get a good foundation. That's why we, we encourage you to get into a life group or ask somebody to help disciple you. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 and 11 says this. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. He is the rock. He is the rock. And God desires for us, when you come to faith in Christ, to pass it on, to share the good news, to tell other people about him. As I've said before, if your faith is worth having, it's worth sharing. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on, be, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. How will they hear without you telling them? There are probably many people in your life that I'll never meet or we may never meet here, and that you are responsible when God opens the door for you to share the good news with them. And you go, I don't know what to say. Just tell them your story. Tell them how you came to Christ. Tell them how he changed your life. Ask God, use you, ask God to use you to be an ambassador where you live. So let's think about this. Are you drifting it can happen. Don't beat yourself up. You may have doubts about who Jesus is, about the Bible. Get back to the word and believe what it says. Are you staying true to your beliefs? As the band comes forward, I want you to think about what Jesus said to the Sermon on the Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount, to multitudes of people who are listening to him. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 46 and following, he says to them, and this applies to us as well, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house that could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built the house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. If you don't know Christ, you're building your life. You're building your life on sand. You're building your life on sand. You're basically saying, I'm going to earn my way to heaven. That's never going to work. If you do know Christ, why not surrender to him? If you're fighting him, if you're running from him, why not surrender and say, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do? There was an old song On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Don't drift from Jesus. He is the solid rock. Let's pray together. If you don't know Christ, why not ask him to be your savior? Why not say, Lord Jesus, I want to embrace you for the first time. I want to give myself to you. I want to surrender and thank you that you died on that cross and rose again so I could have eternal life. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. If you do that, if you invite him in, tell someone. Let us know so we can pray for you and encourage you. As a believer in Jesus, are you drifting? Are you kind of moving away from where you used to be? And you know you need to get things back? That's why we have this time right now where you can come forward.
<clears throat> and pray with someone. Or you can just bring it to God right here. Right here in the front. God tells us, cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. Lord Jesus, we desire that we would be a church that surrenders to you, that follows you in everything we do. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.